We'd cycled 360 kilometers and were arriving in Bristol, a city I'd spent a few years living in as a university student. But in the time that I'd been gone, it was clear that things had changed a bit. Signs pointed to places that no longer existed. Street names and businesses that I once recognized were now called something else, and some had been removed altogether. And a plinth in the middle of a square was now notably missing its statue. Why? Well, Thousands of protesters across the world have shown their support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Demonstrations have been taking place around the world over the death of African-American George Floyd in Minneapolis. We are looking at long-term jail sentences for these vandals and these hoodlums. Similar Black Lives Matter murals have been painted on other New York City streets. I totally understand uh, the, uh, the, the anger, the grief, uh, that is felt uh, not just in America, but around the world and, and in our country. What's his name? George Floyd! 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 Anti-racism protesters rallied again around Britain on Saturday. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Debate is raging over monuments to those involved in the nation's imperialist past. Bristol is many things. One of the UK's most artistic cities, the 2015 European Green Capital, and the birthplace of the chocolate bar. But whatever it may be today, its foundations as a prosperous city were built on slavery. You see, Britain was a huge player in something called the triangular trade. Ships would set sail from Europe, carrying things like textiles and rum, which would be traded with West African tribes for slaves. These men, women and children would be packed together in unimaginable conditions on ships and taken to European colonies in the Caribbean and North and South America. Around 20% of them wouldn't survive the journey. Once there, they would be sold, often to plantation owners, and the ships loaded up with sugar, tobacco and cotton before returning to Europe. This huge triangle drove the horror that was the transatlantic slave trade. In the UK, there were three ports with easy access to the Atlantic that were big enough to act as slave ports. London, Liverpool and Bristol. Many of their residents built huge fortunes in the slave trade. And after the UK abolished slavery in 1833, the government paid out the equivalent of around 16 billion pounds to slave owners as compensation for their quote unquote property being taken from them. Until the 2009 bailout of the banks, it was the largest financial bailout in British history and made slave owners even richer. With all their new wealth, some of these people gave money to charity or to their communities, funding things like schools, churches, and hospitals. Over time, statues went up honoring them because of the donations they made, and are still there today. And that's raising uncomfortable questions. What are we doing celebrating these people who made their money in the sale and transport of slaves? During the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests that spread across the globe following the murder of George Floyd in the USA, Bristol found itself on international news when frustration over a statue of Edward Colston and decades of attempted negotiation with the local council to have it removed boiled over and protesters tore it down. To learn more, we met up with Sean, who's on the We Are Bristol History Commission, which was set up following those protests to help understand the city's past. The History Commission really is a way to use the Colson statue toppling as a starting point to have this conversation about divided histories of the city, but start to open it up to look at other aspects of the city, including gender, class, um, you know, working conditions and all these other areas.
So who exactly was Edward Colston, and why was his statue so controversial? He became Deputy General of the Royal African Company. He was the second highest, most powerful person in control of the transatlantic slave trade on behalf of the British. They basically owned the boats and the ships that were transporting the Africans from you know, one space to the next. He became incredibly wealthy during that trade. He donated huge amounts of money to the city, gave a lot of money to charities, he was still being used today in charitable organisations. So those two things exist at the same time. You know, he, he donated to charity, absolutely, but he also made his money from the transatlantic slave trade. But it's not just statues. Colston is everywhere in Bristol. Streets, buildings and businesses bear his name too. Although that's starting to change, with many business owners choosing to drop his name for something new. We had to be seen to be doing something. It had been on our agenda for a while, we had been talking about changing it. This just very much sped up uh, the process. It's probably long overdue for a lot of places. So we will be the open arms. These changes are happening because, for a lot of people, these statues and place names are symbols of something deeper. You can look at the economic divides of people themselves, you look at the African diaspora and the, um, you know, the percentages in the prison population, percentages that are, that are you know, failing you know, school, school stats and those kind of things, you know, the amount of black people that are in mental health uh, situations. So all of these things are legacies of you know, a racism that, that has echoed through time. And, when you look at it in the cold light of day, you say, well, that doesn't look like racism. They're not calling you this, they're not calling you that. And that's the difference, that structural racism isn't about calling anyone names. It's actually about how people are treated in society. So they're the echoes, and they are very invisible. And that's why lots of people don't fully understand how state trade that ended in 1834 to still have legacies today. If you think about the George Floyd, uh, the Black Lives Matter protest, that is an anti-racist campaign and they're raising awareness about anti-racism. It's not a campaign to topple statues, it's not a campaign to change street names. They don't change people's lives. You know, I'm more concerned about people like George Floyd and Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Derek Gardner, all these people that have been killed, particularly by the hands of the police. The statue's just a symbol and it's not actually doing anything. It's just something to react to. In Britain, attempts to start conversations about our colonial past and its legacy often meet some pushback. People can feel like you're either attacking them or trying to make them feel guilty or apologise. So I think it's often easier to talk about oppression in other countries. We're still very happy to talk about the Second World War. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. So we're quite happy to talk about history when we're the victors or it's quite e e easy to talk about history when it's far away. So we can talk about civil rights in America, we can talk about apartheid. But when it comes to what happened here and what Britain was involved in, that's when people can start to get defensive. Why are you talking about this? Obviously it's part of something that happened and it needs to be remembered as much as we remember D-Day, V-Day, Holocaust. All these histories need to be remembered. So why is it when we talk about transatlantic slave trade, all of a sudden, that shouldn't be remembered? Why, do you know what I mean? It's, for me, there's huge hypocrisy there. The debate has been particularly fierce over the statues, with some claiming that removing them, even if you put them in museums, is erasing history. And on some occasions, BLM protesters have been met with counter-protesters, vowing to defend these monuments. So the calls to say that toppling the statue is erasing history it wasn't at all, you know, the people who toppled it really understood history and they're saying to about the people of Bristol, is this how you want the city to be representing itself in the present day? They don't want Bristol to be seen to be celebrating slavery. It is uncomfortable to recognise atrocities in your nation's past. And if you don't feel they've affected you or your identity, it might be easier to just not think about it. White people also have a race, also have an ethnicity, but they're not thinking about it all the time, so they don't have to. Men also have a gender identity, but they don't think about it all the time, so they don't have to. Women think about being female because actually they're forced to, because they're not living in an equal society. Same as 
people of colour are having to think about, uh, you know, racial identity. So you say the same about class. If it's not part of your day-to-day -day experience, and it's not part of your, you know, what makes you feel whole as a human being, then you don't, actually don't have to think about it. It's quite easy to go through life not having to contemplate these things. It's true that when I lived here, I didn't often think about the racism embedded in Bristol's history, because I didn't really know about it. I walked past a reference to Colston pretty much every day without a second glance, and I had no idea he was so involved in the slave trade. Maybe it's my own ignorance, but there's no plaque or information explaining it. So how would you know without doing your own research? And how often does anyone Google the history of the street names they pass? But it turns out it wasn't just me. The people we spoke to gave mixed responses as to whether they thought much about the Colston statue and places named in his honour. I hadn't thought about it before, and when I moved to Bristol, I didn't put any kind of connection to its history after the BLM movement. That's when it all kind of all like came together, and I realised like there's a lot of racism behind mm. Bristol's history. No, I don't take the notice, really. No, stuff like that. I don't take the notice. Not, not particularly. No, it doesn't really come to mind. Yeah. Um, so to encourage discussion and raise awareness about the city's past, since its toppling, the statue has been recovered from the harbour it was tossed into, and Sean and his colleagues relocated it to a display. So now the Colston display is in the Emshed Museum, which is the city's museum. It's just a kind of a light touch display to say this is the statue, this is the reason why it's here, and please fill out the survey and tell us what you would like to see happen next. The main thing is that we have to live in this city together, so how are we going to learn from this so we don't repeat this? Because none of us want the same conversation happening in 20 years' time. Do you know what I mean? It's like so long overdue. Statues and street names might not seem important at first glance, but it's not really about what they are. It's what they symbolise and honour. Those pushing to change them don't feel they're erasing history, but instead addressing it properly and confronting racism in Britain's past as well as in society today. I mean, this is Britain. I'm under no illusion. No matter where I lived in Britain, there'd be connections with transatlantic slavery. You know, tr the funds from transatlantic slavery funded the Industrial Revolution. Empire spread around the world, and it wasn't only England that was a part of it. You know? So you have to not make these things make you insane, because they can do if you really focused on every single nuance in the city that you felt had a connection with transatlantic slavery. You wouldn't leave your house. You know, Bristol is my home, Bath is my home, Barbados is my home. You know, I was born here. I am black, I am British, I'm African, I'm Bajan. Do you know what I mean? We all have these multiple identities, but you have to reconcile them as best as you can. And I guess one of the ways I'm reconciling them is telling the stories about it. Bristol is not that unique in its connections to the slave trade. A lot of British cities have dark histories. But as some statues come down and some plaques go up, it is an example of one that is starting to confront its colonial legacies.